All right, thank you very much for the introduction. Um, I'm very excited to be here today for a couple of reasons. Uh, one is that I'm really passionate about what I do. Um, I study proteins for a living, or I don't really study them anymore, but I still work with them. Um, the other reason is that I have a little bit of a relationship with the college. My wife is a professor here, and so when she says, you know, you have to do a spectrum lecture, uh, I pretty much have to say yes. Um, so the title of my talk is Unlocking the Proteome. And to start with, I'm going to ask uh, what seems like it might be an obvious question, but it's really not. What the heck is a proteome? Okay? Like, how do we define that? And so it turns out the answer is actually a little bit complex. And before we can define what a proteome is, uh, we need to talk about what proteins are and where they come from, how they're made, and what they do. And so before I define a proteome for you, I'm going to give you some background about what proteins are. What are proteins? Okay, so most people, when you think about proteins, you think about your diet, right? Proteins, uh, foods that are rich in protein, things like meats, eggs, nuts, um, and maybe there are some weightlifters in the room and they may want to supplement their diet with something like whey protein to help build muscle. Um, this is generally what people, this is what comes to mind when you think about what proteins are, okay? Now, a biochemist, or a cell biologist, when they think about proteins, they think about this. And I remember the first time I saw pictures like this, I was terrified. Like, what the heck is that? Right? So what these are, are they're, they're three-dimensional pictures. They're actually cartoons of proteins. This is what proteins look like in three-dimensional space. Okay? And so before we really understand anything about these structures here, these really scary-looking, squiggly protein uh, diagrams, Let's, let's talk about the basics, okay? So my first biology lecture, lecture biology 101, it's the first day of class. What the professor talked about are the building blocks of life. What is involved in life? What molecules? If I have a cell, what do I need in that cell in order for it to function uh, as life? And so there are really four basic building blocks of life that we think about. Okay, one is, is lipids, okay? We have carbohydrates, we have nucleic acids, and we have proteins. And so I'm just gonna go through each one of these one by one so we can understand what we're talking about. So I'm gonna start with lipids, okay? Lipids make up the membrane of our cells. It's a physical barrier that surrounds our entire cells, uh, the, uh, the entire part of our cell, and it basically decides what can get in and out of our cells. It's semi-permeable. Some things can cross this membrane, and some things can't. Many things can't. And the reason it can act as a barrier is because it's a lipid or a fat. Okay? We know that our bodies and our cells and water is required for life. Right? Lipids and fats don't really mix together with water. If anybody's tried that at home, if you maybe put some oil in some boiling water, right? it doesn't mix together. And it's because of the physical properties of those lipids. So we have this phospholipid bilayer. It has this uh, fatty acid middle part that is hydrophobic. It, it's not soluble in water. And then we have this, uh, this uh, hydrophilic head. And that is, is the part that's uh, surrounded in the water. Okay? So we have this membrane. We have water on the outside, water on the inside, and then this fatty lipid bilayer that acts as a barrier. Okay, the second building block, carbohydrates. So the main job of carbohydrates is to act as a fuel source. We think of carbs, we think of really yummy foods like spaghetti and croissants and all the things that you're not supposed to eat anymore in 2015. Um, but for the most part, our cells use carbohydrates as a fuel source to, to fuel the proteins that are involved in the biochemical reactions of life. And carbohydrates are used for a few other things in cells, but for, for basic purposes, we can think of carbohydrates as like rocket fuel. Okay? The next thing we have is nucleic acid, or DNA, or RNA. Okay? And what DNA does in our cells is it acts as a blueprint. And because we have a Star Wars movie that's about to come out that I'm really excited about, and I'm really hoping is much better than the three that came out a while back, um, I have a little blueprint here of an X-wing. Okay, and I have another little reference to Star Wars later in my talk. But our DNA actually acts as a blueprint. What is it a blueprint for? 
It's a blueprint for proteins, okay? And in case you can't tell, I'm a little biased, but I think proteins are like basic, the most important thing in life. And so this is an example of one of the types of proteins I studied when I was in the lab. It's called an integral membrane protein. And that's why I was talking about the lipid bilayer. So here we have, again, a picture of this lipid bilayer. We've got, in this case, ions, but it really doesn't matter what it is. We, um, and they can't get across this membrane without the help of a protein. This is a protein that's living in that lipid bilayer. And it's acting as a channel. It's, it's allowing these ions to go through the center of the channel into the inside of the cell. Okay? So the next thing I have is just basically description, like what do proteins do? And the answer to that question is really easy. Proteins do everything, okay? Um, and, and I have a whole bunch of examples here, and I'm gonna go through them kind of quickly. But I just showed you an example of a transport protein. That's a protein that allows the transport of a, of a biomolecule across the membrane that couldn't normally get across that membrane without, without the help of the protein. Another example of a transport molecule is like hemoglobin. It transports oxygen in our bloodstream, inside our red blood cells, okay? Uh, we have examples of structural proteins. These are proteins that help give cells their shape. Uh, things like collagen and elastin and keratin. Things like actin. Those help provide structure for our cells. Okay? Um, con contractile. Okay? So again, this is another thing with like actin. Right? It's involved in movement and locomotion. Proteins are why we can move our muscles. They're why we can walk. Okay? Um, we have enzymes. Oh, that's a big one. We have lots and lots of different types of enzymes in our cells. Enzymes catalyze chemical reactions. They speed up the rate of reaction of, uh, uh, for chemical reactions. Uh, enzymes do things like break down our food. They do things like convert carbohydrates into chemical energy in the form of ATP. They do things like break down great big proteins into little tiny little molecules. Um, Another example, hormones. Hormones is are, are types of proteins that act as messengers. So, for instance, when you eat a meal, um, a hormone called insulin is secreted into your bloodstream and it goes to all your cells and it basically tells your cells, okay, it's time to eat. And your cells then upregulate all of the proteins involved in digesting that food source. So it's a way for cells to talk to other cells. Um, we also have examples of receptors. So we have cells all throughout our body and sometimes we want them to do certain things and so we send things like hormones to those cells. The way we transmit the, the message into the cell is through a receptor. The hormone will bind to a receptor, the receptor changes and it sends a signal into the cell to do something. It doesn't really matter what it is. Um, and then of course there's a whole bunch of examples of proteins involved in the immune response. Our entire immune system is based on proteins and, and their function. And so you can see, like, proteins are pretty important. They basically do everything. In the abstract of my talk, I said they're the business end of life. The reason I say that is because they, they carry out all the reactions necessary for life. They, they do it all. Okay? And so what I have here is, is, a, is just a simple diagram of what we call the central dogma in biology. We still call it that. Okay? Remember, DNA is our blueprint for proteins. And so we go from DNA... It's, it's, it's a blueprint that's converted by a process called transcription into RNA, which is just simply a message. And then it's, that message is converted into protein through a process called translation. And that uses uh, uh, some RNA and protein that are, that are called ribosomes. And it's not too important that you know that, I just kind of wanted to mention it. So, proteins are made up of molecules called amino acids. And there's about 20 of them. 20 different amino acids that make up our proteins. There's a few extra ones, and there's actually an extra one on my list here. It says 21 amino acids, and there's a couple more than that. But there's really 20 that biochemists sort of care about. Um, and if you ever take biochemistry class, you'll have the fun times of memorizing all of these different structures and all of the names. In fact, my professor, um, if we didn't spell the amino acids correctly, we lost points. You had to be able to draw all the structures. You had to know the short name, the individual letter name, for my talk, I just kind of want you to recognize that amino acids fall into some simple subcategories, some groups. We have charged amino acids, we have um, polar amino acids, some special cases, amino acids with, cysti or with um, sulfur in them. Um, and then we also have a lot of these hydrophobic amino acids. These are the types of, pr of amino acids that are in those integral membrane proteins I was talking about. Remember, hydrophobic is, is water-hating. 
It's, it's basically, it can be, uh, it can mix with those, that lipid bilayer, but it can't, it's not soluble in water. It won't mix with the water, just like the fats and lipids. And so when we talk about proteins, we talk about their structure. Structure is very, very important for protein function. And so I'm just going to describe to you where that structure comes from, okay? So again, these are just, these little round circles represent individual amino acids. And as a protein's being made by ribosomes, you get this long stretch of amino acids. And it, and it basically, it's, it's just generated, um, the ribosome just puts new amino acids onto the growing um, protein chain. And so this is like the primary sequence. It's just the sequence of individual amino acids and what order they go in. And that's really important because what it confers is secondary and tertiary structure. And that's where we really get into how proteins function. And so here I have an ex uh, the two most common types of examples of secondary structure. One is an alpha helix and one is called a beta sheet. And all this is is the individual amino acids just fold up into this little helical shape. And I even brought a doctor, the other Dr. Stringer who works here had a little model in her office and I brought that along with me. Like an alpha helix kind of looks like that. The beta sheet is, is, is more of a kind of a flat sort of surface. And as the protein grows and folds up, we start to see this tertiary structure. So I go back to this slide because hopefully it makes a little bit more sense now. See, in this structure, we have this little alpha helix and we have this beta sheet, and you can see some helices here, and you can see some sheet here and here. So that structure is what gives a protein its function, and that's what this slide is all about. Hopefully I can convince you of that in this slide. So here again I have my little cartoon of my, my integral membrane protein. It's sitting in my membrane. Its job is to allow these ions to go through the channel into my cell, okay? Here is a, a, a little bit more precise rendering of, of a very similar type of protein, right? This is, this is also an ion channel, but instead of this little cartoon here, we have the alpha helices, and I don't think there's a little bit of beta sheet maybe there, um, but these alpha helices that are sitting in this membrane basically generate like a pore, right? So you've got a bunch of vertical helices that make a little hole. And then we've got a little regulatory portion of, on the protein that opens and closes to allow those things to go in and out of the cell, okay? The amino acids that make up these particular alpha helices, chances are those are some of those really hydrophobic ones, the ones that don't like water. And remember, they're in this lipid bilayer, so to be able to sit in there properly, they need to be hydrophobic. And so depending on what the protein does, it's made up of different amino acids, you get a different structure and therefore a different function. So now back to our question, what is a proteome? And I'm just gonna go ahead and read the definition. The proteome is an entire set of proteins expressed by a genome, a cell, tissue, or organism at a certain time. Specifically, it's a set of expressed proteins in a given type of cell or organism at a given time under defined conditions. Okay, it's a blend of the word protein and the word genome. So what does that mean? The, all the cells in your body have the same DNA, save a few little mutations here or there, okay? So in a brain cell and in a liver cell, you have the exact same blueprint. But in a brain cell, the proteins that you have are, are different from the proteins you have in a liver cell because liver has a different function than brain. And so different proteins are expressed to make that cell a liver cell or a brain cell or a kidney cell or a skin cell or whatever you like. And so cells can have a proteome. Um, tissues can have a proteome. The proteome of a, an entire heart is different than the proteome of your foot, if that makes sense. And then people have their own proteomes, right? My proteome is not the same as my wife's proteome. The proteins in my body are, it's the same type of proteins, but they're expressed at different levels and in different ways so that we're just slightly different. It, what, it's what makes us different. And again, that all comes from our DNA because DNA is a blueprint for proteins. And so now I'm gonna transition into the second half of my talk where I'm gonna talk about specific examples, okay? So to understand the proteome and to understand proteins, I'm just gonna talk about a few examples of proteins I've worked on through my career. And I'm gonna start with one that I actually didn't work on. This is kind of a special protein for me. Um, and so let me just set the stage for you. 
I was a senior in college. I didn't really know what I wanted to be. I was thinking maybe I'd go be a nurse, or at first I wanted to be a dentist, but that didn't really work out. And I was like, yeah, I don't really know what I want to do, but I have to take biochemistry because it's part of my major. I was majoring in human biology. And so by the time you get to biochemistry class, you've taken lots and lots and lots of science classes. You've taken biology, you've taken chemistry, you've taken physics, you've taken organic chemistry. You probably have taken some genetics courses. Um, but bio, in biochemistry, it is, is the study of proteins. And so to understand proteins and how they function, you kind of have to know all of that stuff. And there, we were just in class one day, it was early in the semester, and one of the examples the professor was talking about was an enzyme called carbonic anhydrase. And this is just a crystal structure of the protein. I actually got it right off of Wikipedia. And this is what the, the enzyme does. It converts carbon dioxide to bicarbonate hydrogen ion. Okay? And the reason that's important, we, we know that right, when we eat, our cells respirate. They convert glucose into ATP. They use oxygen, and they generate carbon dioxide. Right? We inhale oxygen. We exhale carbon dioxide. But carbon dioxide's a gas. It's not soluble in liquid, right? And so we need to, it's a little bit soluble, but it's not soluble in the amounts that we can actually move it through our bloodstream. And we, have, we can't have gas in our bloodstream. You get an embolism and die, right? And so this enzyme converts the carbon dioxide into a bicarbonate, which is soluble in, in liquid. It's not a gas. And it also acts as a buffer. And, and so all of that stuff's kind of interesting, but what really, really struck me, okay, was how fast this enzyme works. This enzyme is one of the fastest enzymes in nature. It catalyzes somewhere between 10 to the fourth and 10 to the sixth, so that's 10,000 to 1 million reactions every single second. That just blew me away. We think about some context there. I'm a senior in college, I'm driving a really crappy car. Think about my car, right? You, car's got an engine in it. The engine, it, it, it basically, it's just, it, there's a piston, it moves up and down, right? Up and down. It generates energy. It moves a two-ton vehicle down the road, and if you're me, it's going about 80 miles an hour, okay? To do that, it works between about 800 and uh, three, four thousand 4,000 revolutions every single minute. And that's a lot. Right? Your, en your engine, you have to have oil in it to keep it lubricated, it'll seize up, it's working really, really fast, it's combusting gasoline. I mean, that's pretty cool, it's, it's amazing. And then we think about our enzyme, carbonic anhydrase. One million times every single second. All that enzyme is doing is, is changing conformation. It's catalyzing that reaction, it's going right? It's just doing it a million times every second. I've been talking about the enzyme for about a, two minutes, right? 120 seconds, 120 million times that enzyme has worked in the last two minutes. One molecule of that one little enzyme. And I don't know about you guys, but I just thought that was fascinating. Like, how on earth does it do that? And the way that it does it is it it's, uses its three-dimensional structure. It folds up into a little glob. It binds its substrates, and it generates its products. It's pretty cool stuff. So now I'm going to talk about some of the proteins I've studied in my career. Okay? And one protein has stuck with me my entire career. I did a, uh, some um, research between my, uh, my undergraduate work and my, my graduate work. Um, and this protein was, involved, was in that, uh, some of that research. Um, all through graduate school, I studied this protein. And in my postdoc, I've studied this protein. Okay? If you walk into any research lab anywhere in the world and you find the principal investigator or the postdocs or the grad students and you ask them, like, what's the most important protein? If you had to pick one, which, which one is it? And the answer is always the same. It's the protein that I study. <laughs> they always say the same thing. Like, the most important protein in the world is the one that I'm really interested in. And so that's what I'm going to talk about for the rest of my talk. The one that I've always been interested in is this protein called ubiquitin. Okay? And this is the three-dimensional um, crystal structure of that protein. You can see some of that alpha helix I was talking about before and some of the beta sheet. It kind of looks like an iron to me, actually. It's got kind of a little handle, and it's got a flat little beta sheet on the other end. 
And so ubiquitin does a few things in cells. Um, it's involved in protein conformation and gene regulation, but it, the, the most important thing that it does is it's, it's involved in protein degradation, okay? And so what is that? Protein degradation is how cells get rid of proteins that they no longer need. So I spent my entire career studying the trash can of cells. Um, and so the way that it does that, we have a protein of interest, it doesn't matter what it is, and the cell decides it's time to get rid of that protein. It could be for any number of reasons. It could be that the protein is damaged. Just like your engine in your car gets damaged, sometimes proteins get damaged. It could be that the cell is going through a cell cycle, a cell division, and it has to get rid of that protein before it goes into cell division. It could be that the cell just doesn't need that protein anymore and it wants to get rid of it. And so the way that it does that is it uses um, a protein called a ubiquitin ligase. It's not that fancy of a name, it's just a protein that ligates ubiquitin to other proteins. And it puts protein mainly on um, lysine residues. Lysine's an amino acid. Um, it can be on other residues, but for the most part, it's lysine. And it attaches these ubiquitins onto your protein of interest, the one that's going to get degraded. Okay? And so that is basically, it's like a baggage tag, is the way that I like to think about it. it you, you tag the protein, and now it's destined to be degra uh, degraded. Okay? And then it goes to the garbage can, which I'll talk about in just a second. Um, there are also proteins and cells that can take ubiquitin off of proteins. So those are called deubiquinating enzymes, and that was an area of focus of, of a lot of my research in grad school. And so rather than adding ubiquitin to my protein of interest, this little Pac-Man looking guy, he's just gonna cut it off, okay? So this will come up in just a few slides. So how does the cell get rid of the proteins once they're tagged with that ubiquitin? Well, there are really two basic ways, and I'm using some analogies in this slide to help you understand what, what these little organelles do. So one of the ways is, is by the proteasome. The proteasome is just an organelle in cells. It's made up of a lot of different proteins because proteins do everything. Um, and here, again, there's a little picture of a ubiquitinated protein. It gets recognized by this protein, fed down the center of the proteasome, where there's a, a whole bunch of what we call proteases. Proteases are just proteins that chew apart other proteins. They break them down back into amino acids, which is what they came from, right? So it's not really a trash can, it's actually kind of like a recycling bin. The cell breaks the proteins it doesn't need or are broken or whatever down into the amino acids so they can be reused by the cell. And I always like to think of the proteasome as kind of like a garbage disposal, because it looks just, this is what it looks like, it looks just like a garbage disposal. And it kind of works the same way too. You feed the protein into the, the lid of the garbage disposal and it gets broken down into little bits, okay? Integral membrane proteins are a little bit more challenging for cells because integral membrane proteins, remember they have those transmembrane domains, those alpha helices that sit in the membrane. And so if I've got a membrane and I've got a protein sitting in my membrane, my proteasome's only gonna chew to about here. I've still got all the rest of this stuff to get degraded. And so rather than using the proteasome in that instance, the cell uses something called a lysosome, and I don't really have a good cartoon picture of it here. All the lysosome is is, a, is just a round little organelle, and inside of it, there are a bunch of those proteases, the proteins that break down proteins. There's also lipases, those are proteins that break down lipids, and um, the, the lysosome is very, very acidic. So it's like, if you think of the inside of a, pro, of a, of a lysosome, it's really, really nasty, right? Again, here's a Star Wars reference. Remember the Sarlacc pit in Jedi where the, you get thrown into that really nasty pit and then you spend years and years dying? Like, that's kind of what a lysosome is, okay? And again, uh, the entire integral membrane protein gets put into this lysosome. And that's the way we deal with, with the lipid and the extracellular domain and all the bits of that integral membrane protein. And so here we get to some specific examples. And I'm gonna show you some data and I'll spend some time explaining it. Um, in, my, in grad school, um, I used a model organism, and that's what most people do. We use model organisms in the science lab because we can't like study people. We can't work on people in the lab, right? We have to use mice or fruit flies or, in this case, baker's yeast to study the things that we study. And since I studied a really basic process that's conserved all through cells, I guess I didn't mention that about ubiquitin. The reason it's called ubiquitin, it's ubiquitous. It's found in every single eukaryotic organism. So even organisms as small as baker's yeast, a single-celled organism, there's a whole ubiquitin system in there. There's a proteasome and a lysosome, 
And the ubiquitin is very, very well conserved. The ubiquitin that's in a yeast cell is almost identical to the ubiquitin that's in you. So I mean, that's pretty cool. It also tells you that ubiquitin is pretty important. And so here I have a picture of my yeast, okay? And I, in the yeast, I'm expressing one of these integral membrane proteins. In this case, it's a methionine transporter. So methionine is an amino acid, and the cell needs methionine to make new protein, right? And so methionine can't just cross the membrane. It needs the help of one of these little transporters. And so in yeast, um, we can look at the methionine transporter by simply putting a fluorescent tag on it. And that's what I've done in this experiment. I've taken the methionine transporter and I've attached a protein called green fluorescent protein to it. Maybe you've heard of that one. It won the Nobel Prize not all that long ago. Um, and so we express the methionine transporter we put it into our cells, and then we can grow them under conditions of low methionine. And so the cell immediately recognizes, like, oh, I need some methionine. And it takes that transporter, and it puts it all out at the cell surface so that it can bring methionine into the cells. So then if we switch the cells, we can take the cells out of the low methionine media and put them in media that has a lot of methionine. And the cell says, oh, I don't need this transporter anymore. I'm going to get rid of it. And so what does it do? It takes it down from the cell surface, and it goes into this, this organelle. In the yeast, it's called a vacuole, but it's the same thing as a lysosome. Okay, so it's a yeast lysosome. And that's where we can see it. We have our methionine transporter fused to GFP, and it's, inside, it's no longer on our cell surface. It's in our, our lysosome. And so it turns out that ubiquitination, ubiquitin, controls that process, or at least it plays a, a role in that process for sure. Okay? And we know that from some older experiments. This is not an experiment that I did, but it, it comes from an older published study by this author here. And um, so it's, it's demonstrating some, some things to you. So we have, this is just another type of transporter. And, and again, it doesn't really matter what the transporter is. What matters is just that it's a transporter and it lives at the cell surface. And so this is a uracil transporter um, under conditions where there's a lot of uracil in our cells. All that uracil, or all that uh, transporter is in the yeast lysosome. Okay, but if we mutate the transporter, I told you before that ubiquitin gets attached to lysine residues. If I take that transporter and I use some, some cloning techniques and some genetics, and I convert all of the lysines, which is what the Ks are, K is a lysine, to arginine, and I express that in my cells, even under conditions where there's a lot of uracil, my protein's all stuck at the cell surface now. And these authors concluded that because this protein no longer has the lysine, it can no longer get ubiquitinated, and therefore it's all stuck at the cell surface. It no longer gets transported to lysosomes. And so that's a pretty good experiment. I mean, this was some of the early studies in this field, and we've learned a real lot since then. This was, I think this was done in the 90s, so it's been a while since, since we learned this. And that's a pretty cool technique. You, know, you mutate a transporter, you express it in yeast, Another reason we use yeast is it's pretty easy to do it in yeast. Yeast are really awesome organisms to work with. Um, if you do this in human cells, it's a lot trickier. Um, but, but it has some problems. And, and so the problem with that method is that, so, we, so again, this is just a, a sort of a cartoon rec rendering of one of these transporters. We have our membrane here, and we have, you know, this line is supposed to basically be the amino acids or the, you know, the, the alpha helices. And then we have some lysine residues, and, and they get ubiquitinated, right? Well, if we take our protein and we start mutating all those lysine residues, bad things could happen. Because lysine is not just there to get ubiquitinated. It's there to help the protein fold up. It may be involved in other functions of that protein. If we start mutating it, we don't really have a good control. I mean, like, what if the thing is completely misfolded, and that's why it's behaving differently? And, and so this is a real problem in this field, because the only way to prevent a protein from getting ubiquitinated was to mutate its lysine residues. And that's, that's challenging. There's no, there's no control for that. You can't really conclude that it's, it's now because the protein's not getting ubiquitinated. What if it's because it's misfolded? And so my thesis advisor and I d decided that we needed a better way. And so what we did was we took one of these de-ubiquitinating enzymes I was telling you about. Remember, we have proteins called ubiquitin ligases that puts ubiquitin onto our proteins. We also have de-ubiquitinating enzymes, and that strips ubiquitin off of proteins. And I did some cloning, and I fused the catalytic domain, or the, the sort of um, 
working part of a debiquirating enzyme onto one of these channels. And we thought, well, this is really cool, because now I can have all, the lysines can all stay the same, I don't have to mutate them. And if this works, it should chew off all the ubiquitin from that protein, and we can see what it does. And so we did that. We took this same uracil transporter, we put a little d ubiquitin enzyme on it, and lo and behold, it's all at the cell surface. We got rid of all the ubiquitin, the protein that we think is, or we now know, is what drives it into the yeast vacuole. We took a protein that strips ubiquitin off, we put it on our protein of interest, and it completely changes the localization back to the cell surface. And what I think is even, even cooler about this technique, um, so the d ubiquitin enzyme, it's just an enzyme. It's got, a, it's got a primary sequence and it folds up into a tertiary structure and it chews ubiquitin off of our cells, oh, sorry, off of our proteins. We know what residues in that enzyme are important. We could mutate one little, mole one little amino acid in that deubiquitinating enzyme, and that, now, that, that becomes a much better control. I'm not changing anything about my transporter other than fusing this, this, this dead enzyme to it, but my enzyme is no longer active, and now look, the, the protein gets ubiquitinated again and it's all back in the yeast back. And so this is just a tiny little part of this study. I didn't include all the other stuff because it gets really, really complicated. But I had a lot of fun. This was such a cool project. I, I figured it out. We started working on it about my third or fourth year. I had tried a bunch of other projects and nothing was working. And, and we just did this one day. We just went into the lab. We took an active enzyme. We fused it to our protein of interest. And we got this really, really awesome result. From this, this type of experiment, I think I got like six or seven publications. It was really great. And now there are people in the field that study ubiquitin and ubiquitin-dependent trafficking that are using my technique to understand more about how their proteins work and how their proteins get ubiquitinated and what ubiquitin does to their proteins. And so that's a pretty awesome feeling. You know, I don't work on this anymore. I, I don't fuse the ubiquitin enzymes to proteins I think are cool but other people are doing it, and it's because of something that I invented. I uh, thought that was kind of neat. So, how much time? It looks like I have enough time to, to talk about uh, some of the work I did as a postdoc. And so, as a postdoc, I still wanted to study ubiquitination and degradation of integral membrane proteins. Um, I, I transitioned away and I, it, um, to study different organelles, though. I wasn't studying um, cell surface proteins anymore. Um, I decided to work for a lab up at the National Cancer Institute in Frederick that studies mitochondria. And so maybe not everybody is familiar with what mitochondria are. Uh, mitochondria are organelles inside your cells. And if you've ever taken a biology class, um, you'll remember that the, the analogy that people usually use to describe a mitochondria is that it's, it's the power plant. It's the powerhouse of the cell. And so what does it do? It, 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 is involved in ATP synthesis. So ATP is the cellular, the chemical energy that proteins use in cells. ATP is made by the, the mitochondria, or made in the mitochondria using a whole bunch of different enzymes. Okay. Um, it uses an electrochemical gradient that's not too important for you to know. It's involved in, of course, cellular metabolism. Um, it's actually very involved in programmed cell death, which is um, important for like cancer and things like that. Um, the mitochondria is a unique organelle. It has its own genome. So it's the only organelle in, in our cells that I know of that has its own genes. There's only about 37 of them, but they're really important. If you get rid of mitochondria genes, they don't work anymore. And the other thing about mitochondria is just like a power plant, mitochondria generate waste in the form of oxidative stress. So that last step of ATP synthesis splits oxygen, and it generates reactive oxygen species, and that is really nasty stuff. It can damage lipids and proteins and DNA. And so the mitochondria and our cells have ways of cleaning that up. But just so you know, um, the cellular power plant is just like any other power plant. It, it makes, makes some waste. And so anytime you look at a picture of a mitochondria in a textbook, there's always this picture of this kind of bean-shaped organelle. Okay, it looks like a little kidney bean. And those, those cartoons come from some very old studies using electron microscopy, and I have some of the pictures here. Uh, where they took cross-sections of cells and they saw these little kind of bean-shaped looking things. And we figured, well, this is what mitochondria look like, and that's how they're depicted in every textbook ever written. 
Some of the newer, more advanced, like grad school textbooks have what they actually look like, and I'll show you what that looks like in a minute. So it turns out that mitochondria are really dynamic organelles. They're not little bean-shaped uh, organelles, but they actually can fuse together and form these really long tubulated organelles. They can form these really big fused together mitochondria, and then they can also break apart into those little tiny beans that we're used to seeing. And that process is really important. It's important for distribution of uh, mitochondrial contents during cell division. It's important for inheritance of DNA, response to apoptotic stimuli, and maintenance uh, mitochondrial homeostasis. And so here, there's a, this is actually a movie. Um, these are U2OS cells, so these are human cells that we, we grow in culture. We have a protein in these cells. Uh, it's got a mitochondrial targeting sequence, so it's just a little sequence that sends the protein to mitochondria. And then it's got DS red, which is just a fluorescent protein, just like that green fluorescent protein I was telling you about before. And so I'll play the movie a couple of times. Hopefully it'll, yep, it'll work. So you can see in the movie, hopefully you can see it, you have these little, these tubules, and they get longer and they get shorter, and they get longer and they get shorter. They're fusing together, and they're fizzing apart. And I'm going to play it again one more time. I want you to go ahead and look at this cell right here. It's about to go through a cell division. So you've got long tubulated mitochondria. They break apart. Kind of goes away for a minute, and then it'll come back. And we've got two cells, and we get fused mitochondria again. Okay? And so we can cause that to happen in the lab, where there are a couple of ways we can cause mitochondria to fizz apart, break apart. So under conditions of very high oxygen, where cells are making a lot of ATP, remember, we use, we use oxygen to, to make that chemical ATP, oxygen and glucose, and then we generate carbon dioxide as a, as a waste product, and ATP is a form of chemical energy. So under conditions like 20% oxygen, that's a lot, right? We've got these mitochondria in, in the cells that are very fused together. You see lots of long tubulated mitochondria. Under hypoxic conditions, where we don't have a lot of oxygen, where there isn't a lot of oxidative phosphorylation or ATP generation going on because we don't have the oxygen there that we need. We see the mitochondria are much more punctate. They're fizzed apart in little dots. Here's another example. So this is a drug called doxorubicin. Doxorubicin is actually used in chemotherapy. It's a chemical that kills cells, and we use it to kill cancer cells in, in, in the clinic. Okay? It basically works by damaging DNA. So our, here we have cells that are not treated with doxorubicin. We, we're, again, we're looking at our labeled mitochondria, and we have these tubulated mitochondria. But when we add our doxorubicin and we take a picture, we see we have much more punctate little mitochondria, the fizzed mitochondria. And so as you might have guessed, mitochondrial fusion and fission is all carried out by a whole bunch of protein. Okay. And so in this instance, we only care about one of these uh, for, for my talk today. It's called mitofusin 2. Again, biochemists are not very good at you know, naming proteins. It's not very exciting. Mitofusin, mitochondrial fusion. I mean, it kind of just tells you what it does in the name. And so mitofusin looks something like this. It sits in the outer membrane of mitochondria. And we don't actually know exactly what it looks like. This is a cartoon that comes from s the sequence information we have about the protein. Nobody's ever crystallized this protein. We've never actually seen its three-dimensional structure. Um, and again, it's really hard to, to crystallize an th uh, integral membrane protein because of that transmembrane domain that's all water hating. So it's really tough to get, to get structures of proteins like that. But we think it lives on the, on the outer membrane of the mitochondria. And it, we think that it hooks up with other mitofusins on other mitochondria, and then that causes the mitochondria to fuse together. Okay. And so here, this is one of my last slides. Um, this is an experiment showing you that mito, mito fusin, what, what's happening to mitofusin 2, the protein, when we treat ourselves with doxorubicin. Okay. So this is an experiment. These are, this is a Western blot. So a Western blot is just a, is a method we use in the lab to look at proteins. We use antibodies, and we get these little bands. And it basically is telling us if a protein is present or not. Okay, that's all you sort of need to know to understand this experiment. And so I've done a Western blot for these four proteins. Okay, we have actin, TOM40 is a mitochondrial protein, mitofusin 1 is a mitochondrial protein, and mitofusin 2 is a mitochondrial protein. And, you can see, and this is where uh, we did a chase experiment. We treated with doxorubicin for zero, three, or six hours. And you can see over the course of that six hours, 
that our mitre fusion 2 starts to go away. And so what happens when we, use, when we lose the protein that's involved in mitochondrial fusion, the mitochondria become fizzed apart. We, we're no longer fusing together, and so the net of that reaction is we get these punctate fizzed mitochondria. And so to, to try to figure out like, how this protein was, was getting degraded, we did something called mass spectrometry. And please don't, you don't have to worry about that too much. It's a sort of a complicated procedure. It uses a really complicated instrument. Um, but using mass spectrometry, we were able to find that this mitofusin 2 protein was highly ubiquitinated. There were several of those ubiquitin ligases, the, the, the proteins that attach ubiquitin to other proteins of interest. There were several ligases associated with this protein. And there were lots of phosphorylation sites. That's not too important for the talk. And so this is the last experiment I'm going to show you, and it's a little complicated, so let's just walk, walk through it. So we, after a lot of work, and this is data that was published uh, almost four years ago now uh, in Molecular Cell, um, we found out that the ubiquitin ligase that, that degraded mitofusin 2 was this ligase called Huey. Okay? We found it in our mass spec studies, and we thought that maybe it was, it was the ligase that degraded mitofusin 2, and so we did an experiment. Um, we did that same experiment where we treat with doxorubicin. So we treat for 0, 2, 4, or 6. And we're using something called siRNA. And that's a technique that, it's a newer technique that we use in the lab to get rid of proteins. So we, we put some of this siRNA in our cells. It's targeted to a specific protein of interest. In this case, we targeted it to Huey. And it makes that protein go away. So we do siRNA against our ligase. Remember, ligase is attaching ubiquitin to the protein. Ubiquitin is what's causing the protein to get degraded. So we get rid of that ligase. We do our same experiment for 0, 2, 4, 6. And we can see our protein is much more stable. And so that's pretty good evidence that this Huey ubiquitin ligase is involved in the degradation of mitofusin 2 and is what is part at least partially responsible for the lack of fusion in those cells. Okay. This is another experiment that we did. So again, it's the same 0, 2, 4, and 6 hours. And this is treated with doxorubicin. On the, le on the left side here, I didn't really mention it. That's DMSO. It's just a control. It's just a carrier. It's not an actual. It's a, it's a, it's a, uh, used, we, we uh, suspend our uh, drugs in it. So we put doxorubicin in the DMSO. It's like a vehicle, we call them. Um, so we have our doxorubicin. We've got cells, this is an overexpression experiment, so we're not getting rid of protein in this, we're actually expressing a whole bunch of protein in this one. And so in our control cells, we've expressed vector nothing. And we can see that at six hours, our, our protein is going away. If we overexpress the ubiquitin ligase that we think degrades our mitofusin 2, it goes away faster, right? And that sort of makes sense. There's more of the ligase, more ubiquitin's getting attached, and the protein will go away a little faster. And here we used something called a dominant negative, and that's a really big scary term that is a little bit confusing. So let me just try to break it down. Um, QE is just a protein, right? It's got a whole, it's got amino acids, and some of those amino acids are critical for its function. And so we knew which one was critical for QE function. It's a cysteine at position uh, 4341. It's a, QE is a huge protein. Um, so we mutated that cysteine to an alanine, and we express this mutant in our cells, and there's still a little bit of the endogenous, the cellular Huey left in the cells, but for the most part, most of the Huey is this, this inactive Huey. There's lots and lots and lots of it. And so, it, and it doesn't work. And when we treat with our doxorubicin, we see the mitofusin 2 doesn't go away anymore. And so these experiments, along with a whole bunch of other experiments that if you're really interested in, you can read about in molecular cell, helped us to understand that Huey is one of the proteins involved in mitochondrial dynamics. And it works by attaching ubiquitin to mitofusin 2. So, um, as I, I'm just going to finish up my talk, I've recently made a little career change. Um, I was in the lab for about 13 years, and I just got a job as a field application specialist with this company, Biorad. And so this is like the shameless plug for my company that I work for. But, it's okay because Biorad's a pretty awesome company. They've been around a really long time. And if you've ever worked in a, in a laboratory, you've run into some of our products. And so field application specialist, it's basically my job to go to labs and teach people how to use instruments that our company sells. 
and how to best use them to study the proteins that they're interested in. And so it's pretty cool. Every day I go to a new lab and I talk to some people about the things they research and we figure out the best ways to use the instruments they hopefully just bought from us on how to study whatever it is they're studying. And so this instrument is called an FPLC. We call it an NGC, but the, our competitor named them FPLCs and they've been around a little longer than us. This instrument is used for purifying proteins, okay? So if you want to study a protein, if you want to study it in a test tube and you need a lot of protein, you can express it in some bacteria and you can purify it using one of these instruments. If you want to get a structure, right? So all of the three-dimensional cartoons I showed you today, those come from crystal structures or from NMR structure, okay? There's two different ways we can look at the structure of a protein. But in order to do that, we need a whole lot of really pure protein. And to get it, we use one of these FPLCs in something called chromatography. Okay? And you'll learn all about that if you ever take chemistry. I'm sure some of you already know about it. The other instrument I have here is called a Bioplex machine. It's something that is, you don't see it as much as you, you see these FPLCs in labs, but it's a pretty cool instrument as well. Um, we can use that. Um, it's basically like an ELISA, which is a method that we use to figure out how much protein is present in a sample. And so if you've got a bunch of cells and you want to know are, are there more or less of certain proteins in the cells, or if you've got some blood serum and you want to see if there are some cytokines that are, that are elevated or decreased because of something you did to that organism, you can use an instrument like this. It allows you to determine how much of, of uh, any given protein is present in a sample at any certain time, okay? It's also a very powerful tool. Um, this is, is cool because in a normal traditional ELISA, we can only look at one protein at a time. With this instrument, we can look at up to 100 proteins at a time. And so it reduces the amount of time you need to run an experiment like that. It also uh, reduces the amount of sample you need. For an ELISA, which is the conventional method, you'd need 50 times as much sample as you'd need to for one experiment with this instrument. And I know this sounds a little bit like a shameless plug for BioRad equipment, um, but just so you guys know, these pictures were actually taken uh, at your school. So over in the ES building, what's the BE building? Yeah, so you guys have four of these things. This is a really awesome instrument. Like I don't, most labs have one of them. You guys have four of them. This is, this is also a really cool instrument, and this, I think you just got this this year. I think I might even be coming here later to train some people how to use it. So, so anytime you guys you know, need to get trained on that, I'll be the guy that does it. Uh, but again, it, it's, a, it's a pretty cool job. And I know that you guys are sort of doing your science education right here because you're using these types of instruments, and it, they don't have to be from our company, right? This is used for some very advanced science. I'd never used one of these until I was a postdoc. So you guys have them here. You can go learn how to use these things. Those are some pretty awesome job skills that you can learn while you're here. And so I have my acknowledgement section and I'd just kind of like to mention a few things before I finish. Um, the first thing is that if my talk was just a little bit confusing and it was a little overwhelming and there's lots of things in there that are really complicated, that's true, okay? It's it, it, biochemistry and cell biology and how proteins work and how they fold up and how they have structure and what they do in cells, all of that stuff is really, really complicated. It's very difficult to understand. And so if you're in your classes, you're taking, you know, my wife teaches microbiology. Um, if you're taking organic chemistry or you're taking calculus and, and it seems really hard, that's because it is. It is really hard. <laughs> To understand any of this stuff I talked to you about today, I mean, I've been doing this for, if you include college, like almost 20 years, and I feel like I don't know anything. And so if you're struggling with a lot of these things, imagine the researcher in the lab who's looking at some data thinking like, gee, is my hypothesis right? Is my experiment working correctly? Is it telling me what I want it to tell me? Is, is this data, does it make any sense? I mean, there, we're, we constantly struggle with this. There's nothing easy about it. There's lots and lots of unknowns. The other thing I want to leave you with is this. Um, if you think any of this stuff is interesting, well, that's because it is. 
Um, it's really, really interesting. It's terribly fascinating stuff. And if you're interested in it, and you're interested in a career in it, there are jobs for you. And it's not just for biologists. You don't have to be a biology major to get into this. If you're a chemist or a physicist, we desperately need you in the biology lab. We don't understand anything about physics or chemistry. We need some chemists to come and help us. If you're into computer programming, we need you. We need you to help write algorithms so that we can make some sense of all of this data we have that we can't organize at all. If you're in st statistics, I don't know anything about statistics. We need statisticians to help us determine if our experiments mean anything. Okay? If you're an engineer, we need you to help us build the new instruments and new technology to move this profession forward. Because it's, it's an awesome thing to do for a living. I mean, my job thus far has been basically to sort of tinker around with life so that I can figure out how it works so that we can do things like alleviate human suffering, so that we can cure disease, so that we can understand what's going on with our bodies. That's a pretty cool job to have. So anyways, uh, just to acknowledge um, the, the past labs that I've worked in, and I'm now working for Biorad, and of course I have to acknowledge my wife. Just in case you were wondering, she's my wife, so that's so right there. <laughs> and here are some pictures. Um, I'm keeping a beehive this year up at Dr. Bernie's farm, so here's a couple of bee pictures, and you can't see them, but my bees are all in that field, <laughs> pollinating everything. And here's a picture of my wife wearing a bee suit, and here's a picture of my wife dressed up as a virus. <laughs> um, here's a picture of my wife running her first marathon. That was last March, and it was an awful day. It was in D.C. It was like 40 degrees. It was pouring rain. And I'm running around the metro trying to run into her at different parts of D.C. That was a lot of fun. Uh, so thank you very much for having me. I really enjoyed talking to you guys.